It is now time for Chapter 5 of The Tower Treasure. Let's go. Hey, Oscar Snuff shouted. You be careful with that penknife. The man who owns this place don't want you ruining his cars. Frank Hardy looked up at the detective. I've watched my mother, father scrape off flecks of paint many times. The way he does it, you wouldn't know anybody had made a mark. Snuff grunted, but you're not your father. Easy there. As cautiously as possible, Frank kicked off flecks of the red paint in a spot where it would hardly be noticeable. Taking a flashlight from his pocket, he trained it on the spot. Joe, leaning over his brother's shoulder, said, There was light blue paint under this red, not yellow. Right, Frank agreed, eyeing Snuff intently. The detective reddened. You fellows trying to tell me this isn't Chet's jalopy, he demanded? Well, I'm telling you it is, and I'm right. Oh, we haven't said you're wrong, Joe spoke up quickly. Secretly, he was hoping that this was Chet's car, but reason told him it was not. We'll try another place, Frank said, straightening up and walking around to a fender on the opposite side. Here, too, the test indicated that the car had been painted light blue before the red coat had been put over it. Well, maybe the thief put blue on and then red, said Smuff stubborn, stubbornly. Frank grinned, well, we'll go a little deeper. If the owner of this establishment objects, we'll pay for having the fenders painted. But though Frank went down through several layers of paint, he could not find any sign of yellow. All this time, Chet had been walking around and around the car, looking intently at it inside and out. Even before Frank announced that he was sure that this was not the missing jalopy, Chet was convinced of it himself. The queen had a long, thin dent in the right rear fender, he said, and that seat cushion by the door had a little split in it. I don't think the thief would have bothered to fix them up. Chet showed his keen disappointment, but he was glad that the Hardys had come along to help him prove the truth. But Smuff was not giving up the money so easily. You haven't proved a thing, he said. The man who runs this place admitted that maybe this is a stolen car. The fellow who sold it to him said he lived on a farm outside Bayport. The Hardys and Chet were taken aback for a moment by this information, but in a moment, Frank said, let's go talk to the owner. We'll find out more about the person who brought this car in. The man who ran the used car lot was very cooperative. He readily answered all questions the Hardys put to him. The bill of sale revealed that the former owner of the Red Jalopy was Melvin Schuster of Bayport. Why, we know him, Frank spoke up. He goes to Bayport High. At least he did. He and his family moved far away. That's probably why he sold his car. But Mr. Smuff said you suspected the car was stolen, Joe put in. The used car lot owner smiled. I'm afraid maybe Mr. Smuff put that idea in my head. I did say that the person seemed in an awful hurry to get rid of the car and sold it very cheap. Sometimes when that happens, we dealers are a little afraid to take the responsibility of buying a car in case it is stolen property. But at the time, Mr. Schuster came in. I thought everything was on the level and bought his jalopy. Frank said that he was sure everything was all right, and after the dealer described Melvin Schuster, there was no question but that he was the owner. Smuff was completely crestfallen. Without a word, he started for his own car, and the boys followed. The detective did not talk on the way back to the Morton farm, and the boys, feeling rather sorry for him, spoke of matters other than the car incident. As the Hardys and Chet walked into the Morton home, the two girls rushed forward. Did you find it? Iola asked eagerly. Chet sighed. Another one of Smuff's bluffs, he said disgustedly. He handed back the money which his friends had given to help pay the detective. Frank and Joe said goodbye, went for their motorcycles, and took Callie home. Then they returned to their own house, showered, and went to bed. As soon as school was over the next day, they took the gray wig and visited Schwartz's shop. The owner assured them that the hairpiece had not come from his store. It's a very cheap one, the man said rather disdainfully. Frank and Joe visited Flint's and Reuben Brothers' shops as well. Neither place had sold the gray wig. Furthermore, neither of them had had a customer in many weeks who had wanted a red wig or who was in the habit of using wigs or toupees of various colors. Today's sleuthing was a complete washout, Joe reported that night to his father. The famous detective smiled. Don't be discouraged, he said. I can tell you that one bit of success makes up for a hundred false trails. As the boys were undressing for bed later, Frank reminded his brother that the following day was a school holiday. That'll give us hours and hours to work on the case, he said enthusiastically. 
What do you suggest we do? Joe asked. Frank shrugged. Several ideas were brought up by the brothers, but one which Joe proposed was given preference. They would get hold of a large group of their friends on the theory that the thief could not have driven a very long distance away because of the police alarm. The boys would make an extensive search in the surrounding area for Chet's jalopy. We'll hunt in every possible hiding place, he stated. Early the next morning, Frank hurried to the telephone and put in one call after another to the gang. These included, besides Chet Morton, Alan Hooper, nicknamed Biff because of his fondness for a distant relative who was a boxer named Biff, Jerry Gilroy, Phil Cohen, and Tony Prito. All were students at Bayport High and prominent in various sports. The five boys were eager to cooperate. They agreed to assemble at the Hardy home at 9 o'clock. In the meantime, Frank and Joe would lay out a plan of action. As soon as breakfast was over, the Hardys told their father what they had in mind and asked if he had any suggestions on how they might go about their search. Take a map, he said, with our house as a radius and cut pie-shaped sections. I suggest that two boys work together. By nine o'clock, his sons had mapped out the search in detail. The first recruit to arrive was Tony Prito, a lively boy with a good sense of humor. He was followed in a moment by Bill Cohen, a quiet, intelligent boy. Put us to work, said Tony. I brought one of my father's trucks that he isn't going to use today. Tony's father was in the contracting business. I can cover a lot of miles in it. Frank suggested that Tony and Phil work together. He showed them the map with Bayport as the center of a great circle cut into four equal sections. Suppose you take from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock on this dial we've marked. Mother has agreed to stay at home all day and act as clearinghouse for our reports. Call in every hour. Will do, Tony promised. Come on, Phil, let's get going. The two boys were just starting off when Biff and Jerry arrived at the Hardy home on motorcycles. Biff, blonde and long-legged, had an ambling gait with which he could cover a tremendous amount of territory in a short time. Jerry, an excellent fielder on Bayport High's baseball team, was of medium height, wiry, and strong. Biff and Jerry were assigned to the section on the map designated 6 to 9 o'clock. They were given further directions on sleuthing, then started off on their quest. Where's Chet? Mr. Hardy asked his sons. Wasn't he going to help in the search? He probably overslept. Chet's been known to do that, Frank said with a grin. He also might have taken time for a double breakfast, Joe suggested. Mrs. Hardy, who had stepped in to the front porch, called, Here he comes now. Isn't that Mr. Morton's car? Yes, it is, Frank replied. Chet's father led him off in front of the Hardy home, and the stout boy hurried to the porch. Good morning, Mrs. Hardy. Good morning, Mr. Hardy. Hi, chums, he said cheerily. Sorry to be late. My dad had a lot of phoning to do before he left. I was afraid if I had tried to walk here... I wouldn't have arrived until tomorrow. At this point, Mr. Hardy spoke up. As I said before, I think you boys should work in twos. There are only three of you to take care of half the territory. The detective suddenly grinned boyishly. How about me teaming up with one of you? Frank and Joe looked at their dad in delight. You mean it? Frank cried out. I'll choose you as my partner right now. I have a further suggestion, the detective said. It's not going to take you fellows more than three hours to cover the area you've laid out. And there's an additional section I think you might look into. What's that? Joe inquired. Willow Grove. That's a park area, but there's also a lot of tangled woodland to one side of it. Good place to hide a stolen car. Mr. Hardy suggested that the boys meet for a picnic lunch at Willow Grove and later do some sleuthing in the vicinity. That is, provided you haven't found Chef Jalopy by that time. Mrs. Hardy spoke up. I'll fix a nice lunch for all of you, she offered. I sure would be swell, Chet said hastily. You make grand picnic lunches, Mrs. Hardy. Frank and Joe liked the plan. It was decided that the boys would have the picnic, whether or not they had found the jalopy by one o'clock. Mrs. Hardy said she would relay the news to the other boys when they phoned in. Chet and Joe set off on the Hardy boys' motorcycles, taking the 12 to 3 section on the map. Then Mr. Hardy and Frank drove off for the 3 to 6 area. Hour after hour went by, with the searchers constantly on the alert. Every garage, public and private, every little used road, every patch of woods was thoroughly investigated. There was no sign of Chet's missing yellow jalopy. Finally, at one o'clock, Frank and his father returned to the Hardy home. A few minutes later, Joe and Chet returned, and a huge picnic lunch was stowed aboard the two motorcycles. When the three boys reached the picnic area, they were required to park their motorcycles outside the fence. They unstrapped the lunch baskets and carried them down to the lakefront. The other boys were already there. Too bad we can't go swimming, Tony remarked, but this water is pretty cold. Quickly, they unpacked the food and assembled around one of the park picnic tables. Um, yum, chicken sandwiches, Chet cried gleefully. 
During the meal, the boys exchanged reports on their morning sleuthing. All had tried hard but failed to find any trace of the missing car. Our work isn't, hasn't ended, Frank reminded the others, but I'm so stuffed I'm going to rest a while before I start out again. All the other boys but Joe Hardy felt the same way and lay down on the grass for a nap. Joe, eager to find out whether or not the woods to their right held the secret of the missing car, plunged off alone through the underbrush. He searched for 20 minutes without finding a clue to any automobile. He was on the point of returning and waiting for the other boys when he saw a small clearing ahead of him. It appeared to be part of an abandoned roadway. Excitedly, Joe pushed on through the dense undergrowth. It was in a low-lying part of the grove, and the ground was wet. At one point, it was quite muddy, and it was here that Joe saw something that aroused his curiosity. A tire? Then maybe an automobile has been in here, he muttered to himself, although there were no tire marks in the immediate vicinity. No footprints either. I guess someone tossed this tire here. Remembering his father's admonitions on the value of developing one's powers of observation, Joe went closer and examined the tire. That tread, he thought excitedly, looks familiar. He gazed at it until he was sure, then dashed back to the other boys. I found a clue, he cried out. Come on, everybody. And that's the end of the chapter. Now, for our Bible story tonight, we have the Tower of Babel. A clean new world lay before Noah and his three sons when they stepped out of the ark. There were no wicked people left. Noah and his sons made new homes. The sons' names were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. After a while, God gave them children. These children grew up and made homes for themselves. Then there were other children. Again, there were many people on the earth. From a mountain in Ararat, where the ark lodged after the flood, the human family moved south into the valley of Mesopotamia and lived on a plain in the land of Shinar. Let us build a city, said the people, and let us make a tower so great and high that its top will reach up to the sky. Then we shall not be scattered over the earth and separated from one another. And so the people set to work. How busy they were. Some made brick. Others mixed mortar, and still others carried brick and mortar to the workmen who were building the city and the tower. They all dreamed of the time their city and their wonderful tower would be finished. Then a strange thing happened. God saw the city and the tower, and he was not pleased. He knew that men would become more sinful if they finished the great tower. Already they were thinking more and more about their own work and less and less about the God who gave them the strength to work. Soon they might forget God entirely and worship the things they had made. God decided to stop their building. Until this time, all the people spoke one language. Now God caused them to speak different languages. The people of one family could not understand what their neighbors were talking about, nor could these neighbors understand the people who talked to them. They could not go on with their great building because the workmen could not understand one another. The people of Babel became restless and unhappy until finally, those who spoke one language moved off by themselves. And that is the end of the Bible story.